Hey, what's up guys? Chris Jr. here for Chris Go Art. Welcome to the documentary filmmaking series. We talked about brainstorming and thinking of different pieces that you need and the type of headspace that you need to get into making a documentary. But now it's time to make one. So I'm just gonna share a little bit of what I learned and some of the some of the obstacles and some of the things that I think are valuable from my process of creating my latest documentary, which if you haven't seen it yet, please go check it out. It's called Sir Opifex. But in this video, we're just gonna be focusing on the shooting, some lighting ideas, and some of the things that I had to do with no budget, no crew, pretty much no gear except for my camera and just one little LED panel. And I just wanna talk a little bit about that in this video so that hopefully it can help you when you are tackling your documentary project. So before moving on to the rest of this video, I've been asked how I organize my projects and uh, what, what I can do to sort of get lookbooks together and what, what tools I use for that process, that brainstorming process, and even what I use to just kind of organize all the pre-pro together. Well, you're seeing it on screen right now. I use Milano and they're also today's sponsor. So I wanted to give them a huge thanks for supporting the channel, but also I genuinely wanted to recommend this to you guys because I use this now for every single project. Uh, you're seeing an example here for a upcoming short film and I can't tell you how important it is to have all of this material in one place that by the way your team can also access, modify, add to. This has been a game changer because I'm a very unorganized person so this was the perfect solution for me to visually put together some game plans for projects. It can be especially crucial for planning your documentary, brainstorming, and putting all those pieces together. And it's what I use for Chris Gart, for the channel, for the company. That is how we run everything and how we keep everyone on task. So really recommend Milano. Check it out. All right, let's talk about the actual filming. So you have your questions. You kind of know how you're going to structure this and you're being open to what the world is going to throw at you. So how do you actually film? How do you set up the shots? What's that process look like? That changes from filmmaker to filmmaker. So I'm just sharing what has worked with me and how I work. One of the ways that I like to shoot is, uh, especially for documentaries, is to get familiar with, with the face and the environment that they're in. And I, I usually want to try to match up the subject, if we're talking about you know a person sitting down for an interview, I want to match their vibe with their environment and also with the way that I'm shooting them and the way that I'm lighting them. So in this scene, for example, we have this retired race car driver. He was a legend and he started collecting cars. Beneath his uh, shop that he now owns, he actually has a huge garage of all these antique cars that he collects. He shared a story that was connected to a car that was there. So it made perfect sense for him to be in that space. So again, it becomes a predicting game. You need to kind of get a feel for the person and kind of get a sense of what they might say and how that might fit in the story. And you need to be very conscious about where you're placing them in, how you're placing them, how you're placing them to camera and so on. Now, as far as placement, what I was really paying attention for here, whenever I was placing my subjects or placing my camera to my subjects was leading lines for the most part, and also what practicals I had to work with in my scene. As I mentioned already, I didn't have much lighting, so this was particularly important for me because I really needed to make sure I was uh, really utilizing most of what the scene was already giving me, and then I could just highlight something with uh, my tiny LED panel, which was the only light I had. And when you're framing up the subjects in this type of way, don't just keep in mind rules. You know, sometimes you can break some, some rules and, and find what shot can best represent your subjects and what they're saying in that moment. One example here is I also got a shot near the end of the interview when we're getting to the more, uh, you know, depressing stuff. I went to a 24 millimeter and I just went all the way back to this sort of hallway uh, where he, he kept uh, these, uh, these sort of rolled up carpets and pieces of fabrics. And this almost gave this dreadful feeling of this kind of tunnel leading into darkness, which really represented his, uh, his feelings of his own industry disappearing. Non 
Now, this is just my personal approach, so keep that in mind, it's not a rule, but what I usually tended to do in these scenes, especially when interviewing subjects, was to start with a wide shot and then get some detail shots and uh, zoom in with a, a longer and tighter focal length. So for most of these interviews, I only had one camera, so I had to switch lenses, but I always started wide. And this is just to uh, you know make the viewer feel comfortable with uh, where they are at in the world, and also to, to place the subjects and to give an understanding of uh, their environment. From there, as the conversation got deeper, and uh, you know maybe as soon as I noticed that there was some gaps or a little bit of breathing room, I would quickly switch lenses, which I had on hand, and I use my 70 to 200 and this was a very nice range to uh you know needing to pull out if i need something sort of medium and uh and then just zoom really in if uh, we hit maybe a more sensitive or emotional part of the story if that is what you choose to do of course that all depends on your style and what you're trying to do but a lot of times and you've seen this a lot in documentaries you want to get a little bit closer that's just because you can feel a little bit closer to the person if you are physically closer it just becomes more intimate so that is something that i recommend you guys really keep in mind aside from the questions and the lenses attached to it lens choices lighting choices all of that in general is part of the story You want to make sure that you're formulating the questions in a way that is engaging, that can uh, lead to a, a long conversation. Uh, sometimes one of the things that helps is, you know, you could be asking something and then maybe you could give an example or multiple examples. So it's like, what do you think of this? Like, do you think it's more of this thing or maybe like that or not so much? What are your thoughts? You know, when you formulate things that way, it, it's more of like you're, you're engaging in a conversation with the person. You're not just saying, so do you think this is cool? No. Oh, okay. You got to create some form of, uh, of a back and forth. And when you are having that back and forth, you need to make sure that you are capturing just their side of the audio and not your own. So make sure you're not getting any overlap. And of course, this uh, is not the case if you are actually in the scene with the person. Maybe you want to have more of a conversation. I'm talking about more of a situation where you're behind the camera, you're prying questions out. Make sure that the audio doesn't overlap because uh, that can be a nightmare to fix in the editing. Keep rolling, keep rolling beyond the takes. Roll as much as possible, honestly, in documentaries. Of course, don't make it too overwhelming to the point that it becomes impossible to craft a story from it later in the edit, but have more breathing room than usual when it comes to cutting your camera, when it comes to even starting recording, because sometimes, you know, there's a lot of candid moments, there's a lot of stuff that happens, even once the person thinks that he is done being interviewed, a lot of truth can come out in those moments and that can be really important to capture. So when it comes to lighting, for this whole documentary, all I had was the flashlight from the iPhone 6 at the time and uh, one LED panel. It was from Aperture, but it's like their very first LED panel that I think they ever made, but still worked great, still did everything that I needed to do, and uh, that's all I had. Sometimes this LED panel acted as a key light, sometimes as a backlight. I would just move it around depending on how much ambient level I had in my scene, meaning if the face was honestly readable enough to camera and it wasn't too dark by just what the practical light was giving me. And uh, if, if that was the case, if I had a pretty solid exposure on the subject, I would throw that as a backlight or a way to edge them or separate them from the background. If I had some nice ambience like was in this case of this garage over here where uh, we see some nice fluorescent tubes that are casting some pretty even and soft ambience from the top, then in that case I just wanted to really bring out a stronger key for the subject's face. This is where uh, the editing again can really help you out if you are dealing with these type of restrictions because this is what the scene looked like before it being graded and this is what the scene looked like after it was graded. So pretty drastic difference and you can start to see that something else is going on. It's not just a color grade. So this is something that we have covered in the past multiple times. It is something that I am really focusing my mentorship program that I just launched with Industry Jump on. So this is a huge topic on its own. We can unpack it in so many different ways. So if you are interested in these relighting techniques in After Effects, I really recommend you guys check out the videos and the info cards. But this can be really powerful. Essentially, just a quick rundown of what this is, is a solid with colors that are present 
in my scene or that I've tweaked to kind of match my color palette. And in this case, I really wanted to bring out the greenish tint of the fluorescent tubes that are around this garage environment so that they can separate the subject more from the background. Because otherwise everything was kind of falling flat, didn't really like the vibe. And by creating this very simple layer of this greenish color and also decreasing a little bit of the contrast, you create something that I think feels very cinematic, that creates that separation, that depth, that is very much needed, especially in a wide shot like this. I made the mistake recently, uh, you know, until a few years back of traveling with so much gear. I mean, pretty much everything I'm using here, I would try to pack in a bag and take on trains, take on planes. And a lot of times you really don't need that. What happened? So the tide started to rise a little bit. Now. This tide trapped us in? The next part, we'll be going through a cave that hopefully isn't flooded yet. Documentary filmmakers, as run and gun filmmakers even, the gear can become a huge limitation. So you think you're adding more gear, you're buying new lights, you're buying multiple different rigs of whatever you're doing, and it, you think that might help and that might speed up things, but really it becomes an impediment. It, it slows you down, it weighs you down, it takes a lot of energy out of you. It might even cause you to miss some key moments. Uh, documentaries are scary, so I get the feeling of like, oh my God, I need all of my gear because who knows what could happen but really think about what that means and how much mobility that will take away from you. I'm sure you're probably tired of hearing how the visuals don't have to be perfect and great, but if the audio is bad, that's how you lose people. And that is true, especially when it comes to documentaries. Like I said before, a lot of times we don't have the luxury to bring all the gear in the world that we want to shoot in the perfect circumstances. And that's just because that's what the moment requires. You have to be there to capture it and that's your priority. And sometimes that doesn't look perfect. So that is where you can have a little bit of room of imperfection in the visuals when you have really good audio. Now, it's not super difficult to get really good audio. The way I did it for the last documentary for Sir Op Effects was having this same exact setup. Four years later, here I am with a lav mic from Rode. This is the uh, Rode Smart Love Plus and they work great. I plugged them into my cell phone at the time. Right now I'm using a TRS converter, still from Rode. It's just a little piece that allows me to then attach it to something like this, like a Zoom H1N. And again, this is also super handy to have. You should have it as an indie filmmaker uh, for documentaries. This can be a really nice tool that you can just slip into people's pockets. Having multiple ones of these could be cool. And this setup honestly is great. The audio sounds pretty good. Of course, if you can get better lavs, you can do that. Uh, but you can really get away with a lot with something as inexpensive as this. This is about a hundred bucks, maybe less. And I think uh, the same goes for the recorder. So again, very simple setup. I used pretty much, not even that, I used just the mic like I said with the phone and that was my interview setup for everyone. And of course, having a sound guy there is always better. Having a boom op is always better. Uh, but you know, if you can't, if you can't afford it, if you can't for whatever logistic reason, if you're flying to a remote location, you can't bring people with you, don't think that getting good audio just by yourself is impossible. This is a really nice hands-off approach because aside from you know checking if the recording and, and monitoring it once in a while, you can just leave it on talent and you know that you're getting good audio. Another good way to do it is if you wanna step up your kit and get the uh, wireless system that Rode offers, that way you can even monitor from the camera, which to me feels a little bit safer. As far as all the other sounds, so non-dialogue sounds, a lot of times I don't worry about it too much because most of the time I end up reconstructing that entirely in post. So I create all the sound design by pulling in different sounds from different libraries, different places, and that can go a certain way and it can be really fun to recreate your, your environment. But of course, it is to your benefit getting real sounds from the actual location. This doesn't have to be while you're shooting. This could even be after you've wrapped 
you know, whoever you're interviewing and you're still in that space, you can then go around and kind of capture certain sounds of that environment, recreate certain interactions that were happening on camera. You know, you can watch playback and then say, okay, there's this type of movement, there's this type of interaction. Uh, let me go and grab that separately. And you can even run around with just the recorder by using the mics that it has, get close to different things that you know you're gonna need in the edit. And that is always gonna be better by having the actual sound from the place because it not only sounds authentic, but it is also a great reference for you to actually hear what that space sounded like whenever you're adding other sounds from different libraries. All right, I hope you found that useful and interesting. I will follow this up with one more video on editing, so definitely don't miss that out because there's gonna be some shots where there's a few tricks where it wasn't just editing to make all of this work and to make it visually look high budget and, and professional when really there was no professional crew. So we've, we've touched upon a little bit of this in the shooting aspect, but in the next video, we're really gonna dial it in into the editing and seeing what tricks you can do to elevate your documentary project. And real quick before I go, I know I've been getting some questions about how uh, people can support the channel and I don't really have a way to do that yet. Uh, I took down Patreon a while ago, but I did release a light effects pack. So if you're interested in VFX or just spicing up your edit with some light elements, definitely check out that pack. I'll link that also in the description down below. All right, guys, that is it. Thank you so much for watching. My name is Chris Trini for Chris Coar, and I'll see you next time. Huge thanks once again to Milano for sponsoring this video and for being such an amazing tool. And to you guys for watching this video, for supporting the channel and uh, watching the documentary Sir Opifex. Thank you guys so much. All right, bye.